So our theme verse for this year of life and ministry together at St. Paul's is Ephesians 2, verse 8. And we're going to bring it up now on the screens, and I'd like to invite you to read it with me right now. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. That's the verse that's going to guide us here at St. Paul's all year, and it's a critically important verse because all religions, all religions, not just Christianity, all religions believe that we need to be saved. They may use a different word for it, but basically all of us agree that this world we live in is really messed up. We are really messed up. And we need to be saved from this mess that we're in. We're messed up morally. Our world is full of people who lie and cheat and steal. A world where people who try to live right often suffer. And those who don't often succeed anyway. We're messed up relationally. It's a world of broken marriages and broken families. As we have seen recently, a world of racial hatred and bigotry. We're messed up financially. It's a world where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. A world where getting justice in the courts is far more based on how much money and influence you have than on whether or not you are guilty or innocent. We're even messed up in nature, and my have we seen this. It's a world of hurricanes and floods and tornadoes and earthquakes that destroy lives and homes and even whole cities. Every religion agrees we need to be saved. The question is, how? <laughs> how can we be saved from this mess that we're in? And what you have to understand is that the answer of Christianity, the answer that Jesus provides, the answer that Paul is talking about in our theme verse is fundamentally different from the answer every other religion provides. Now, in order to demonstrate this, we're going to have to look, at least very briefly, at what some of the other ways to be saved are that are proposed by other religions. Now, that can be kind of stale and boring. So I'm gonna to try to do that a little more creatively today. And for that, I'm gonna need a volunteer today. Oh, but I have already selected her. She's one of our new teachers, Mrs. Ashley Klitzing. Would you please come forward, Mrs. Klitzing? Let's welcome her. You can stand right here. Nothing like hazing the new teachers, right? Okay. Now, I'm from Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, so I'm going to give you a very Minnesota understanding of all of this. Let's imagine that Mrs. Klitzing is going fishing. There you go. Okay? Obviously, she is quite unprepared at this point, other than that awesome hat. So in order to help her for this trip, we're going to need to outfit her today. Now, if Mrs. Glitzin were to go fishing, what would be the most important piece of gear that she would need? Anyone? No, no, you're all wrong. That's right. A cooler. She's going to be in that boat all day long. She's going to need some refreshment, right? So I have filled her cooler with the ultimate in fishing pleasure, a six-pack of Dr. Pepper. Okay. You can hold that. Okay. I want to use this uh, to help uh, represent one of the options that we have, that she has when it comes to salvation, and that's Buddhism. If you look at the screens, you'll see that Buddhism is based on the four noble truths. Buddhism teaches, number one, that there is suffering in this life. We can imagine Mrs. K sitting out there in the boat all day long and catching nothing. She's suffering. Number two, suffering is caused by desire for pleasure. Think of her sitting out there all day in that hot sun and how much she's going to desire that Dr. Pepper. 
Number three, suffering will cease when these desires cease, leading to nirvana. So over the course of the day, she's going to drink all that Dr. Pepper, and that's when the fishing trip is over, right? And number four, you see the path to nirvana comes through right understanding, right thoughts, right speech. That's Buddhism. But now there's other options. What else does she need? Shout it out. Oh, I heard it. She's going to need her rod and reel, right? And what's she going to do with that? Well, all day long, she's going to cast it out and reel it back in, right? Cast it out, reel it back in, over and over and over, right? We'll use that to represent Hinduism because that's what Hinduism is all about. Its central teaching is reincarnation, that when you die, you come back as something else in the next life. And you keep coming back like that because Hinduism also teaches about the law of karma, which basically means that your actions in this life determine how you will be reborn in the next life. If you do well, you're gonna move up. If you do badly, you're gonna move down. That's Hinduism. Now, what else does she need? I heard it. A tackle box, right? A rod and reel alone is not going to cut it. So I've got five things in here, five things that you're probably going to need. You're going to need a lure, a weight, a bobber, a stringer to hold fish, and then, of course, my favorite thing of all here, you might want to slip this on. This is your special mitt so you don't have to touch the gross fish, right? All right, here, can you hold that? Very good. Okay. Uh, we'll use this to represent... Islam. I mentioned there were how many things in the tackle box? Five. Uh, that's because there's five key pillars to the religion of Islam. You'll see first there's the creed uh, that they have. Every Muslim recites their creed. There's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. You can set it down. That's fine. Uh, the second pillar is prayer. Every Muslim prays five times a day facing Mecca. The third is almsgiving, giving money to the poor. Uh, the fourth is fasting during the season of Ramadan. The final one is pilgrimage. Every Muslim who's supposed to do the, uh, is able to do this is supposed to travel to Mecca at least once in their life. That's Islam. Now, what else does she need? Anyone? No, no you're not going to get this one. She's going to need the DNR rule book, right? Very good. I know none of you devout fishermen would ever go without your DNR rule book, right? What is that? It's the book that has all the rules and laws about how many fish you can catch, how big they can be, and so on. We'll use that to represent, can you guess? Judaism. Because Judaism is all about rules and laws. They follow the, the rules of the Torah, the, the books of Moses. And there are rules and laws for all kinds of things. Rules about worship, rules about festivals, how to celebrate them, rules about morality, and so on. That's Judaism. Now we've got one more thing we can't forget. And that's the life preserver, right? Life preserver. Now, you might think, well, that must be Jesus, right? No. And I'll explain why that won't work in just a second. We'll use the life preserver to represent New Age thinking. Because New Age thinking basically says, you can save yourself because you are God. New Age thinking says that humanity's only need is to become aware of their divinity. And so there's a bunch of ways you can do this, a bunch of different life jackets you can put on, if you will. Might be through crystals or astrology or chanting or meditation or whatever. That's New Age. So there you have it. There's some of the major options Mrs. K has when it comes to being saved. We've got Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, and the new age. Now, there's something very, very important that you have to notice here. There's a common theme to all of these things. Despite their many differences, the one thing that all religions except Christianity agree on 
is that there is something you have to do. You follow the rules or the laws. You perform the right rituals or practices. You exhibit the right moral behavior, and you will be saved in the end. But there is a big problem with all of these options. The problem is they don't understand the real problem that Mrs. Klitzing has. The real problem isn't that she just needs to catch fish. Do you know what the real problem is? The ultimate human dilemma? Paul says what it is in our reading from Ephesians 2. He says, as for you, you were dead in transgressions and sins. The problem isn't just that she needs to catch fish. The problem is this, that Mrs. Klitzing has fallen overboard and her lungs have filled with water and she has sunk to the bottom of the lake and she's dead. And Mrs. Klitzing, since you're dead, we won't need you anymore. Thank you for coming up. You can return to your seat. Let's thank her. I'll take the hat too. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you don't want that. Thank you. You're a good sport. Nothing like killing the teacher on the first day too, yeah. Right. Seriously, though, that, that's the human problem. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So it doesn't matter what religion you are, or even if you have no religion, the problem's the same for all of us. We sin. We violate God's law. We've rebelled against him. And as a result, our world is really messed up. Our lives are messed up, and it's no one's fault but ours. And then Romans 6.23 gives us the really bad news. The wages of sin is death. That's the problem we all have. Whether we think about it or not, whether we realize it or not, we're dead. Now, think about that for a moment. If that's true, and I submit to you today it is true, then you have to ask yourself, what good will any of these other things do for you? See, it's, it's not that no other religion has anything good in it. That's not true at all. There are lots of good things in lots of other religions. Uh, Islam says we should give money to the poor. I mean, how can you be against that? And Buddhism says we should try and restrain our pleasures. That's not all bad. I mean, we kind of live with an obsession with pleasure in the United States. And if Judaism gives us some rules for moral living, I mean, is that bad? Of course not. But if we're dead and we need to be saved, the answer cannot be that we have to do something. But that's what all religions except Christianity teach. They're all centered on works but they completely miss the essence of our problem. We're dead. And if we're dead, then none of these things are gonna help us at all. Not the cooler, not the rod and reel, not the five things in the tackle box, not the DNR rule book, not even throwing a life jacket. Don't you see, we're dead, we can't do anything. And this is where Christianity is amazingly unique. Because Jesus says, the only way you will be saved is by his grace, which is to say, he has to do something, not you. Now you might say, well, if we stick with this fishing analogy, where does Jesus fit in? Well, what does Paul say? Ephesians 2, 4. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. And this is so important. Jesus is not like any of these things, not even like the life preserver. Paul says Jesus is the guy who's in the boat with Mrs. K. And here's what Jesus did. Now keep in mind, he didn't have to do any of this. He was in the boat, safe. 
And Jesus wasn't just uh, going to be there to help. No, because Mrs. K wasn't just dying, she was already dead. And here's what Jesus did. At the cost of his own life, he dove in. He swam to the bottom. He picked up her lifeless body and brought it back to the boat. He did CPR and brought that dead person back to life. Because of his great love for us, God, who's rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead. That's grace. And that's the only way any of us are ever going to be saved from ourselves and from this messed up world that we live in. If it's going to happen at all, it's got to happen by grace. God has to do everything. And thank God he has. Jesus lived the perfect life we could never live. He died the death we deserve to die. And he rose from the dead, conquering death and the grave for us. And those who trust in him will be saved. Not because of anything they do, but solely by what he did. Solely by his grace. And friends, when we understand that and really take that to heart, we realize that if we're saved by grace then you also have to live by grace. If you've been saved by grace, then your job as a follower of Jesus Christ is to extend that same grace to others. And when we do that, I'm telling you, amazing things can happen. Years ago, I heard this amazing true story that illustrated this so powerfully to me. It happened to a guy named Tony Campolo, who's a well-known Christian speaker. And for many years, uh, Tony has traveled all over the world to tell people about the grace of Jesus and how they can be saved through him alone. And one time, many years ago now, Tony traveled for a speaking engagement that he had from the East Coast, where he lives, to Hawaii. And that's a very long trip. And so Tony said he was extremely jet-lagged when he got there, and he found himself wide awake the first night at 3 in the morning. And since he couldn't sleep, he decided to go to this local cafe and have a cup of coffee and a bite to eat. So here he is, sitting in this little cafe all by himself in the middle of the night, when suddenly 10 or 12 women come and walk in and sit down at the counter all around him. And very quickly, it became very obvious to him by the way they were dressed and how they were talking that all of these women were prostitutes. And because he was all by himself, he couldn't help but overhear the conversation of the woman sitting next to him. The woman next to Tony said to the woman next to her, Hey, you know what? <laughs> Tomorrow's my birthday. <laughs> and the other woman said back to her kind of meanly, Well, so? <laughs> I mean, what do you want me to do about it? Throw you a birthday party or something? <laughs> and she said, dejected, No, I don't want you to throw me a party. I've never had a birthday party my whole life. Why would I have one now? I'm just saying tomorrow's my birthday, that's all. They sat there a little while longer, and then they all got up and left, and Tony just sat there thinking about how sad this woman's life must have been to never even once have had a birthday party. And so after the women left, he, he asked the man behind the counter, he said, do you know this woman who is sitting next to me? And he said, oh yeah, that's, that's Agnes. And he said, does she come in here every night? And the guy behind the counter said, oh yeah, every night. They all come in here every night. And Tony said to the guy, did you hear her say that tomorrow is her birthday? She said she's never once had a birthday party in her whole life. He said, how about you and I throw Agnes a surprise birthday party tomorrow? And the guy behind the counter loved this idea. He even offered to bake a cake for her. I mean, this is what he did, right? So, 
So later that day, Tony went to the store and he bought some decorations. And the next night, a little bit earlier, about 2.30 in the morning, he actually went to the cafe and decorated it for Agnes's birthday party. And sure enough, about 3.30 in the morning, all of these prostitutes came in again. And they all shouted this time, Happy birthday, Agnes! And they all sang happy birthday to her. And it was just a great moment until the man behind the counter brought the cake to Agnes. Because when Agnes saw the cake, she started to cry. She was just so overcome by emotion that as she thought about how these total strangers would be so kind to throw her a surprise birthday party, I mean for her of all people, and they shouted at her, cut the cake, Agnes, cut the cake. And, and Agnes said, do I really have to cut it? I'd like to just take it home and show my mom. And, and Tony said, well, I mean, it's your cake. You can, you can do whatever you want with it. And so Agnes took the cake and walked out of the cafe in tears. And, and everybody just sat there in stunned silence, this awkward silence, not knowing what to say. And so in the middle of the silence, Tony just said, hey, you know what? <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> and so he did right there in the cafe. He prayed, led them all in prayer, prayed for Agnes, prayed that she would be well and be whole and know that she was loved by them and most of all loved by God. And after he said amen, the man behind the counter started pointing his finger at him. <laughs> he said, I knew it. <laughs> I knew you weren't just a public speaker. <laughs> You're a pastor. <laughs> what church are you the pastor of? And Tony said it was one of these amazing moments where he just had a flash of brilliance. Because he said to the man behind the counter, I'm the pastor of the church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> and then the man behind the counter said the most amazing thing. Something Tony said he would never forget. He said, no, you're not. Because there is no church like that. Because if there was a church like that, I'd join it. That's the power of grace. And friends, that's our calling, to be that church. To be the church that understands and teaches salvation by grace, but also to be the church that extends God's grace to everyone, and especially to those who need it the most. May that be our theme this year and every year. Let's bow our heads and pray.